This is Empowered Human Academy. Welcome home. Things kind of rise and fall in that creative process. There's certain things that are just, you know, you're, you're just going through process and there's no getting around it. it. And it's not exciting, it's not fun, and it's really boring actually. But they, it's sort of the bridge to the next little exciting step. This is about love. This is about light. This is about the idea that you, you have everything you will ever need. And this life of yours, this is where you grow, you expand, and you remember who you really are. I'm Abe. I'm Isaac. In Empowered Human Academy, we join with humans of all kinds to feel the inspiration that can only come with empowered living. The stories you hear today are unique, but the energy, the energy you hear today belongs to you too. So with hearts wide open, let's begin. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Empowered Human Academy. Today we are joined with a very awesome, awesome creative person that we've been dying to sit down with and have a conversation with, Lene Getz. Lene, thank you so much for being here. How is your day? Really good. How about you guys? You know, we're just really enjoying the summer heat and all that summer has to offer. What about you, Isaac? I'm excited to talk to you, Lene. I've been a really like enthusiastic admirer of, of your work and appears for a long time. And without without grounding the conversation in my opinions of everything, because that's the opposite of how this works, um, we begin instead with the question of your own identity and how you feel about yourself. So as we always do, the question is, what words of identity feel like home to you? Not words that you know you would necessarily present to someone else if you're trying to make an impression, though there might be overlap. But when it's just you coming home to yourself, what words of identity feel right? Um, I think artist. Um, even though I have a hard time cozying up to that, that as a label, I feel that it's always been part of who I who I was. So, um, and mm. um, I think also just the roles that I, other roles in my life that I identify are being a wife, a daughter, a sister, a friend. Mm. Those are all. Yeah. In, you know, lived in roles for me. Yeah, totally. Um, I want, let's talk, I mean, artist was the first thing that came up. So let's, let's begin there. Um, what's the difference between artist as like something that you feel versus artist as a label? Like, is there a meaningful difference between the flavor of those two ideas? Yeah, I think I internalize it more. It's more unconscious how I feel about it. I don't think I, I never really felt, um, drawn to, the sort of, um, I'm not a, definitely not a theatrical person, not like an artist is a theatrical entity, but I'm, I think I'm, I'm a much more quiet sort of plain kind of person. Um, and, and I guess that's sort of a weird word to use. I remember having, um, an art opening once in Chicago and this woman was so eager to meet the artist and she came up to the gallery owner and she just wanted, she was just, I gotta meet the artist. I gotta and he said, oh, she's standing right here. And she turned to me and she said, oh, but you look so normal. <laughs> <laughs> That's and I thought, wow, okay. what, are you, what did you think I was going to look like? But um, so I think, you know, it, <laughs> I've sort of identified with the creative um drive of that just and i've and sort of that's moved through my life for quite some time pretty early on i, I think both peter and i hmm. you know embraced creative careers which were um hmm. you know uh, definite careers of uncertainty that you had to get comfortable with and all sorts of mm -hmm. unfamiliar or uncomfortable realms that you were in because it's not easy to tell someone you're an artist. The, the, the first thing they think is you don't have a job <laughs> or mm -hmm. what's your real job or what do you really want to do with life? Mm -hmm. So it, it was, mm -hmm. it's a hard thing to move into and feel, um, and feel like it's legitimate. Hmm. Yeah. But you, sense. I think, you know, if you feel it, you do. And there's just no, like it always was there, even though I wanted to maybe, you know, do something more conservative or structured or dependable. I always kind of sort of sabotaged it because I just wanted to be making and creative things. So 
Yeah. Um, that's, that's super interesting. So you, you said you making sure you're hearing right. Like you, you there were parts of you um, that wanted to pursue things that weren't this. And then you subconsciously like read your sec, redirected yourself back to art. Am I hearing that right? Or how would you describe that? Yeah, I, I think, you know, it, the uncertainty that goes with and the, the sense of failure and um, just all the things that go with um, the creative process, um, trying to sort mm-hmm. of live by that was really hard. It is really hard for everybody, no matter what you're doing, no matter what creative thought you're having towards your work, it is going to get slapped down. I mean, even, and I'm saying mm-hmm. even if you're a doctor, and you have a creative thought about something, you'll probably get slapped down because it's not part of the usual way of doing things. And it really mm-hmm. like um, messes with your ability to just be this individual in the world and or just find this sort of place where you just vibrate and, and things are coming alive. So, um, but at the same time, you know, it's really scary to just be hanging out there without any security net, which mm-hmm. a, a, a straighter path would take you on. And also mm-hmm. family members get really worried for you. <laughs> My mm-hmm. parents were very, very concerned when I started taking arts seriously, when I started turning down other things and just saying, no, I really want to do this. Um, that started, mm-hmm. you know, at first they loved that I did art and made art or made creative things like, um, but they just, as soon as they saw that that was really what I wanted to do, then their support turned into massive fear. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, um, Interesting. Okay. Yeah. But I think that's, that's true what was for all like? of us, right? I mean, it's hard to, when you mm-hmm. sort of want to go out on your own and do anything, it's, it's, it's a lot of anxiety around mm-hmm. that by people who love you. It's just, you know, they want you to be safe and careful. And I think those are the, the things you can't be in the world. You have to really hmm. sort of be great. Yeah. What What do you do? What do you What do you do with that? What What did you do that with that? Or if you've got, you know, if, if the if those relationship dynamics are still in your life, like what What does one do with that? This podcast is about like what we do with ourselves, but we're also part of a like we don't exist in total isolation, right? So what do we do right. when a creative path forward for us means you know fear as experienced by someone else? Well, how do you handle that? It's hard because it's not only fear, it's disapproval. Um, it's all the, it's all mm, the okay. negatives that, and it's not coming from a bad place. Most of this and what's the mm-hmm. most painful about it is it's coming from love. They love you. My, mm-hmm. my parents, my yeah. friends, they, they just don't want you to be hurt. It's, it's a normal mm-hmm. experience or feeling. And they, I think a lot of it is just people projecting onto you their fears of, oh my God, that'll be so, even though you're probably you've got it kind of sort of figured out or you've made that deal in your head. <laughs> you, mm-hmm. you, you're going to live or die by it and you made the deal. And, but that's not something anybody else can wear lightly or not like you wear it lightly, but you'll take it. And I think other people like your parents or your friends, it either, um, it will, it, it confuses and scares and disappoints especially if it takes a long time for you to, to come to this place where you're on your own two feet. And it took us, it took me a, quite a long time. And so throughout a good chunk of my life, I had to deal with a lot of um, disapproval that was getting even more and more intense. And um, I just had to, you know, I, I just took a lot of different jobs and just made sure I was taking care of myself so that I wasn't a complete, like, if I was a complete burden for people, that would have been a different story. But, you know, it, I took care of myself. I just kept doing what I wanted to do on the side. <laughs> was the, Sure. Was there, was there a time in your journey as an artist where, you know, your family, your friends who were nervous about you or were worried about you, um, it kind of, the, the script kind of changed whether it be, you know, when you landed a big client or when, was there a time where they were like, oh, actually this, you know, Lene could be doing something really cool and their kind of fears dissipated? Yeah, for, for sure. They, they, they would spike, you know, something like I get a little magazine 
article written in the local paper about something I created. And, um, and I say created because I mean, I really wasn't making art. I was doing a lot of design and I was a maker mostly. So, um, for a while I had, I had sort of zeroed in on these lamps that I was making from recycled materials. And, um, and it actually kind of took off a little bit and my parents were thrilled because I wasn't until that point, they were like, well, my daughter is scavenging old copper gutters. <laughs> they didn't know how to talk <laughs> about me to anyone. <laughs> And she's hammering nails and making lamps out of these things. And, and it was, they, they didn't even go there. Actually, one year, my dad sent a Christmas card to his friends. And he wrote a totally fake career for me. <laughs> no. Yeah, it was so painful, but it was also kind of funny. Um, mm -hmm. but I mean, it was, it was, they just couldn't, they didn't know how to verbalize my life to anyone. And so, mm -hmm. but when it, when it finally had a little attention in a place where they would feel like, oh, that was, that's good. Then they kind of backed off a little. And, um, and then I think, you know, from there on, they were, they were never not, they were never 100%. There was always in the back of the, the conversation, like, when are you going to get a real job? <laughs> what are you going to do with your life, really? Um, but mm -hmm. as things slowly, slowly inched towards, clearly I wasn't going to do anything but this, really, um, that kind of settled down. And then eventually things did start to um, move into a place where they could. Suddenly it was in a realm where, Oh, I can say my daughter is working with Carmen Miller. Yeah, I know what that means. So, for for me at that point, it was fun. It was great, but it it, it wasn't like I needed that validation at that point. But it was it felt great to be mm -hmm. working with people that they actually felt validated by. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Was was there like any conversations that you remember? You know, because I, I imagine it could be kind of discouraging sometimes to to get a card from your dad that said, you know, a fake career that you're in. Um, was there any conversations of boundary setting? Like, you know, hey, dad, hey, parents, like, this is affecting my mental health. I'm on my own journey kind of thing. Please support me in a way. Were there any kind of conversations like that along your journey where you had to kind of reiterate the fact that you were not changing your career um, and ask them for support? No, my parents were from... Uh generation that, that they had all their kids in their 40s so the generation gap for me just as a kid dealing with my parents was huge um so they mm -hmm. were in their 40s to late 40s when they had uh, five kids and um so by the time i was dealing with my parents in that way they were in their late 60s 70s and um it was, you know, my dad fought in World War II. It was a generation that just, you know, didn't have those conversations. So basically, hmm. we just didn't talk about that. We talked about everything else except that. <laughs> and I, I was fine with that because I think in the end, um, it would have just been too much. I didn't feel, I didn't, I can't say I felt mental. I mean, I guess it was sort of, it was painful yeah it was painful to see the fake career and, and feel like oh man you're, you are so ashamed of me i guess but mm -hmm. well not ashamed i think i never really put it in that way i i mostly okay. felt like oh you know you'll get it someday i just had the confidence that someday yeah, they'd yeah. Get it. Um, yeah. Hmm. that's interesting yeah i'm i'm um, reminded of a time i was talking with a friend recently who's kind of connected to Hollywood. And it's interesting. He was saying like, you know, some of these big actors and, you know, big models and everything in between their kind of big movies or shoots, they're like, okay, what's going to happen next? So it's like, not just, you know, local artists or whatever. It's people who are, you know, we see in movies often too. And it's just, I feel like that's kind of the human. I liked, I liked hearing that because it's like, wow, we're all really human experiencing a lot of different things as uh, similar things as artists, uh, whether it be, you know, like an independent artist or a Hollywood movie star kind of thing. It's just really fascinating. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uncertainty is baked into our lives. And some of us have it more intensely than others. 
but um, it's there, and you just have to find a way to get comfortable. <laughs> yeah, that that kind of leads to what I wanted to ask about. Like, I mean, yes, there's there's lots of uncertainty, um, but you spoke earlier about how, like, internally, like you you make your piece of the thing that you're going to do. If I can paraphrase poorly, and so I want to know where your sense of um, like internal. Uh, confidence or maybe safety, maybe safety is a better term. Like there are people watching you and they don't feel safe about what you're doing. And maybe that's a projection. Where does your internal sense of safety and decisiveness come from? I suppose like what, like what enabled you to set out on this path of, of artistic expression, creativity, all of this. I know it's, 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 I think, you know, I was a middle child. And um, so I had a lot of, family, I had a lot of siblings around me and, um, especially mm. a brother, um, who I was right next to, we were almost Irish mm. twins. And, um, it was a really grounding, stabilizing experience, having kind of built in friends at a very early age mm. who were yeah. fun to play with. And, um, you could like, we, and my dad was extremely, um, freaked out that he had six daughters in one <laughs> he should have had six boys and cool. one girl <laughs> he was very army and so he you know we would do mm -hmm. things with him and he'd be like men he'd just call all of us men and we would do like he, he was like men we're going to take the tractor apart today so my mom was hyper feminine and she dressed all of us in these like matching little tea party dresses and we'd go out and work on the tractor with my dad and he, you know, like, oh, amazing. Wow. it would be, it, and we'd have to do it because that's what he wanted to do. He, you know, his men had to do mm -hmm. this with him. And, um, like I would be sucking gasoline out of a tube <laughs> to put it in wow. the gas can. Um, yeah, it was, so it was kind of this like siblings and also a dad who was like, you, you can do anything. And not only can you do anything, but you're going to have to do these things because hmm. you're my daughter in the way that a man would say that to a son, but he just didn't have enough sons hmm. and he needed all of us to be his sons. Hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think it was, it was from that, you know, that a childhood of not being, there were no ceilings and um, hmm. we were allowed to, be fearless. I mean, we could go up to my dad and say, you know, we want to roller skate down the bar roof onto the trampoline into the pool. Is that okay? And he'd be like, yeah, let me oil your roller skates off. <laughs> wow. So, I mean, was there a time? Yeah. Go ahead. No, I mean, yeah, it was like danger things were like, okay, you could do really risky mm -hmm. things. Yeah. Does that carry into like in in what way is that spirit still with you, right? Like those are very formative years. Is that is that is that mentality still like right where you're at, or has it evolved, or where are you at right now? Oh, it's one thousand percent still with me. It, it scares Peter sometimes cool. that I will, mm. you know. I mean, I'm very. It's funny with our dog. I'll I'll like let her loose outside, and Peter's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> we have to watch her. She has to be on a beach. You can't do that. And I think, okay, this is where the extreme permissiveness of my dad with our physical selves comes into my DNA, where I don't worry about, I just assume she'll be fine. And my dad just assumed yeah, yeah. we would be fine. And we always were. It was like the Mr. Magoo mm -hmm, thing. Mm -hmm. You know, we just, yeah, very deep. But if any of our friends came over, they were the ones that would break their leg or arm or nose. Or poke, you know, sure. their eye with something. They didn't get that mm -hmm. from a group protection. Hmm. So assuming we weren't allowed, nobody was allowed to come to the house. <laughs> was it? Do you think it's because you were brought up in an environment where this was normal and practiced, versus maybe your friends were in kind of more physically conservative, you know, environments that you know where they weren't rollerblading off of the roof, kind of thing? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think that there were kids that crawled on their stomachs through the tall grass to get to our house because all the danger toys were there. And, um, and my dad just allowed it. And we just 
didn't think it was, he didn't put fear into us. And, and I, I remember I was riding, um, my sister had horses and I was riding a horse and it was in this, we, we kind of lived in this sort of farm field part of Illinois. And I was out riding the horse and my dad and a friend of his were over and his friend, they were standing up by the house and his friend came running out. He was so worried about me and he was screaming that I should slow down and stop the horse. And at that moment, for the first time, I felt afraid. And it just sort of entered my body in this way that I was like, what am I doing? What am I doing? And until that man, that other adult, came out with that kind of extreme fear on his face, um, uh-huh. I, wouldn't have, I didn't think it. And I, it really, like after hmm. that, I was always a little nervous on a horse. But up until that point, hmm. the only expression I would get from my dad if I rode really fast was a smile. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. This is a fascinating juxtaposition of what you were saying about like your your parents' relationship to your you know artistic career. Hmm. Oh like yeah, the, the fearlessness on the one side. And Isn't the fear, that funny? Well, the, you said it wasn't quite fear, but yeah. What do you think about that? You, you know, Isaac, it's really funny. I've never really put that together like that, which is crazy. But yeah, his it, his fearlessness didn't translate into, I think, because it was more, um, it was also, uh, we were sort of taking on the role of sons in that we had to carry on a name mm. and do something in the world. So that really okay. down a lot of... Um, you know, sort of what will others think of you sort of thing. Ah, kind of uh, I see, I see. Uh, maybe in a, in a different, like up until the point of like childhood, nobody cared. Um, that was yeah, yeah. crazy wolves. But the minute we got out into the world, that wasn't, that wasn't right anymore. We had, we needed to be, yeah. which is kind of crazy because up until then, it was like the, the wild animals now suddenly had to be, you had to do something very conservative in a sense. And that wasn't how we were mm-hmm. raised. And I think my parents that never, that it just was like one of those things that never really connected. Interesting. Yeah. I love how complex people are, right? Because yeah. at one hand, you know, you were running around kind of in other people's eyes, maybe reckless. And then your dad's eyes, very just proud and excited to live. And yet, you know, we still hold these kind of this truth that like we are complex and we could be scared, really, really scared of one thing. And then in the next breath, be like, not scared at all. I just find it really fascinating. I love, I love humans. And on the, yeah. on the flip side too, right? Like leave it to children to, um, what to, to expose the the contradictions in in a way of, in a way of thinking, I'm, I'm using more broadly here. I'm not, I'm not speaking specifically um, to your father, Lene, but I don't know. It's, 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 it's interesting how, like what I'm hearing, like you, you, you picked up the fearlessness, the fearlessness and carried that, um, and carried it forth in ways that, you know, someone else, um, couldn't have because they already had conflicting perspectives. Um, I'm adding more of my commentary here than I I want to. Um, so let's (laughs) to, to return, to return to you and how, and how this, and how this worked. Um, Here's here's where I want to go with this. So it's it's currently a theory of mine that you know we come into this life getting some things for free and some things not for free. And it sounds like there's a kind of um, like in some ways very physical confidence that you carry of fearlessness. Um, what's something that you've that you've learned? Um, and maybe for bonus points, I don't know. Maybe the fearlessness has helped you learn this something. But like, what's something that an understanding that's grown in you over time, not something you were born with, but something that you had to come to learn. Patience. Patience is the thing I've had to come to learn. (laughs) For sure. And fortunately I married someone who is basically a Buddha (laughs) Mm, and is very, very comfortable with patience and has been a good teacher Mm -hmm. in that realm. Yeah. 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 What is it? What is it like? Um, what's, what, what, what was it like? I guess the question is as simple as that, right? Like to, to learn that next to somebody who you, you know, do life so closely with, who has that 
in hand? Like, what is the learning process like? Um, well, it's painful. Um, I think okay. that it's one of those things that when you ha- when you struggle with something, it, it's and especially if a, a life partner, you know, I think sometimes some of us marry or connect to people whom we would want to be, um, or or whose obvious obviously whose traits we admire um, and respect. And and so for me, I found a person who if I could come back in another world, I'd come back as Peter. He, he just seems so complete to me. Mm. And, um, it's such a joy to be with him. He doesn't leak all over. <laughs> and, um, but I mean, mm-hmm. he's, he's, he's just a really, he's able, he's very contained as a person. He's learned a lot of things. And, um, that's a gift to be with somebody like that. And I feel like, um, early on I was very leaky and, um, very impatient. I wanted things to happen sooner. And, um, I wasn't good with process, which is an important thing in creative endeavors, mm. um, and making something and yeah, understanding yeah. something. Um, and I just wanted to do, I just wanted to get out there and do it. And that's great too. Cause that, that brings momentum and you get on, you move on quickly or you, you get into it. But at a certain point, Mm -hmm. things will only get so far if you don't, if you don't really stop and think about the long haul. And, um, Mm -hmm. and that's an important, that's an important thing. That's actually the world is is sort of dealing with right now. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this has been a wild run, but it's going to be a very quick one (laughs) because we haven't really, we never really thought about the long haul. And patience is the thing that mm. our species just really, really needs. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah. I, you know, feel like that, that was a long one uh, <laughs> for me to learn. <laughs> I'm still learning. Has there been parts of, yeah. Has there been parts of your kind of creative journey that that has stood out to you, whether it be working with a brand that you were excited about that things maybe didn't turn out or, you know, in the speed that you wanted it to, or, um, maybe with your creative process. Um, and, and if there was a time that kind of stands out to you, I'd love to kind of know about that and your experience with that. Yeah. Um, I think I always felt like there was going to be some big giant lottery win of a moment with work. Mm -hmm. And, um, I just thought it was all going to like at one point turn and it was just going to be amazing. But in the end, mm. it it really isn't like that. I mean, there's there's like highs and you feel like this is going to be it, but it never, it's like always a lot of work and it's always, or for me, this is just, I, I, you know, I don't know if there are people that have those lottery ones, but um, it's always, ha- I've always had to really manage my expectations and every time, even with like really exciting collaborations we've worked on, it's just a slow process that, you know, isn't, it's not like to, for us, it wasn't like the next day we were suddenly this big, big thing. It, it's just, we slowly, slowly, slowly are building a creative catalog and it just, um, hmm. is, it, it's a long process and there was no big lottery win. I mean, there was nice, you know, exciting endeavors, but, um, I think it's kind of a, I think people get really, you know, like there's going to be this big, like you're going to sell your company for 30 million or you're going to, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Just, it, it's, it's a long process and it doesn't, it rarely works like that. And in, in for most people, you're, you just really mm-hmm. want to be in it for the long haul and you want to be proud of the work you're doing and it, thinking of mm-hmm. like, you know, some big, big payout or something, you know, theatrically amazing happening is it really throws a lot of cold water on the good stuff you're, you're slowly building up. Hmm. How sure. do you, how do you stay inspired, um, in the slow buildup? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, for a long time, we were just hungry. We and like on every sense hmm. of that word, we just, we had to keep working and we, we were creative. So we were living by our creative, um, endeavors and we were just hungry and, that hunger kind of kept you curious. You were always looking and, um, it was, you were never satisfied. 
I, I didn't, there wasn't anything. I, I think there's nothing actually I've ever done where I felt like, Oh yeah, that's okay. Now I'm set. <laughs> I don't need to make mm-hmm. anything else. Mm-hmm. So, um, mm-hmm. I just feel like, you know, th- th- there's always that kind of hunger to, um, to get that sort of feeling of when you start getting into something exciting, things kind of rise and fall in that creative process. There's certain things that are just, you know, you're, you're just going through process and, um, and there's no getting around it It, and it's not exciting and it's not fun and it's really boring actually. But, um, but they, it's sort of the bridge to the next little exciting step. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've, you've mentioned and then emphasized the word process a couple of times. Can you just give me your working definition of that term? Well, process is just taking the time to figure out how to do something right. It's the step-by-step. It's not skipping a step. And I think what I've had to learn the whole patience thing is I wanted to skip all these steps and just, you know, just put something out there. And it was not possible to do that especially as we got bigger and especially as we started working on, you know, mass, not mass producing, but um, manufacturing some things. Um, Then you're working with other professionals who need you to follow a format. So it was getting comfortable with the step-by-step process of whatever, you know, creative involved or whatever that creative um, endeavor involved. Mm -hmm. Mm. All right. You know, we talked a little bit before our recording about some big projects that you have going on. And um, you mentioned one of them being Louis Vuitton, um, just kind of casually. And I was like, okay, this is amazing. I'm curious (laughs) about, um, are you intrinsically or extrinsically motivated in the stuff that you do? Mm, I don't know if I understand that question. Like what, what motivates you in your work? Like, is it to get these big clients or like, oh. you know, what kind of satiates the desire to continue creating? Is it working with big partners? Is it, you know, a mix of both where you're actually doing what you love or you know, does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Um, I'm just doing what we love. I, I think we're always, when we said this to the Louis Vuitton team, when we were on the zoom call, we didn't, we couldn't figure out how they found us. And, um, they acted like, it, like I was Brad Pitt saying, how did you find me to make this movie? <laughs> They're like, you're out there. <laughs> and I mean, not that I think I'm Brad Pitt or that we think we're that big or anything, but I mean, they were just kind of like, it felt, I suddenly felt stupid saying, how did you find us? Because we're just, we, we are findable. And um, I think that has kind of been the feeling whenever anybody big has come along and knocked on our door to do something, the feeling has always been, Oh wow! How did you get here? So, like, what wrong turn did you take? <laughs> but um, they have always been really confident with their choice in us, and it's been a lot of fun. So, um, it, it it's but it's mainly just happened out of the blue because it isn't something that we've put like on our wish list. So, um, we what our wish list is is the things we want to see come into the world. And so mm. the, the short answer or the long answer is definitely it's intrinsic, how I, how we feel about what we want to do creatively. I love that. Um, does, does kind of the, the external partnerships, you know, with these big brands kind of boost your confidence? You know, you said, how did you find us? Does having someone who is really big, you know, in the design world like that, does that kind of instill a sense of confidence or, you know, boost your energy and the stuff that you're doing a bit more? Um, at first it's really scary. It's scary to have a, a company the size of Louis Vuitton and, and the prestige, uh, or when we worked with Herman Miller or Toshin, these, these companies that are designed within reach, they, when we've had them talk to us about projects, it, it's been scary at first. Cause you know, it's just a whole different realm. Um, but then as soon as we've gotten into conversations, what's been really um, reassuring is they've, they've been really um, supportive, enjoyable, fun people. It, it, not, and not like um, posturing, intimidating kind of thing. 
it's, it's just been mm-hmm. really relaxed, which I've always, you know, there's always some stigma I had about how it would feel, you know, right mm-hmm. before the call to talk to them and, and not being feeling prepared. And they're just really relaxed. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. at a certain point, some of these creatives that work in these companies, they're just, they're very confident in their roles and um, they're not yeah. there to impress mm-hmm. you with their position. They're, it's very direct. Sure. It's, here's what we need from you. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So yeah. I love I love a good direct person. Yeah, that. It reminds extremely. me um, just just a hair of what you were saying like much earlier about you know roller skating off the roof of the barn into the trampoline or something like that. <laughs> the same tenor of fearlessness. Yeah, um, you you use the I, I wrote it down because the phrasing is just so cool. The things we want to see come into the world. If you if we were to just generalize with me for a moment over over all the things that you do want to see come into the world, what like, how would you summarize all of that? Like, is there, is there a, is there a through line we can talk about, about, you know, what you want to bring forward? I think we've, we've kind of, Peter and I have sort of gravitated towards everyday things that are in our lives that sort of are quietly there, but so important. Hmm. And, um, those are the things I feel drawn to when I look around and want to participate creatively. And also when I, the things that I treasure are often very useful things. So it's, you know, art is amazing. And, um, and I do have art in my life. Um, but I tend to gravitate towards the everyday humble things that just make your life a little better, a little more enjoyable that help you connect to get you through the day. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. You just you, like gravitated. It, it sounds, I don't know, to, to me that implies like a, like a gradual kind of being drawn to a thing. Like, is this an understanding that kind of like descended over, over you as you figured out or as, as you were looking back on, on the things that you've chosen in the past or um, I, it's, I, I don't, I'm, I'm struggling to come up with a specific question to this. I guess was this was this something that that dawned on you like oh this is what I'd want to do was it trial and error like doing a bunch of things then figuring out what landed or like how did you land on that description for yourself? Um, well, I mean, I think you know you move into those things kind of unconsciously, and um, and they, and they just resonate with that part of yourself that has always known that sort of knowing mm-hmm. center in yourself. I think when you find Mm-hmm. that when something resonates in you, it, it's, it's incredibly important and you have to honor it. And, you know, that's yeah, just yeah. how we move forward in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I've, I've asked this question of a, of a couple people. Um, I'm curious about your take on it. Like that, that knowing center, um, but pretend for a moment you're talking to somebody who has has no idea, you know, how to even begin to to feel that or to feel disconnected from it or something like that. Like, how do you describe that sense of knowing? Like, for some people, it's very physical. Um, for some people, it manifests differently. But how how do you know when you know? If that makes sense. <laughs> that's, a, that's a big question. Um, I think I think you know when you know because you know. <laughs> I think there's a lot. I mean, that's fair. Yeah. yeah. I think there's a lot about ourselves that gets taken away by the world we're in. There are voices that say, you will need an expert to tell you how to do that. Or, you know, that's not something that's in your realm. This person will, that a lot of things get taken away from us very early on that we already know, but we sort of surrender that to this kind of society we've lived in that says you really don't know how to build a house and you really don't know how to make a, a, you don't really know how to make food and you really don't know how to dress the way you should dress. And like, there's so many like of these preconceptions that are built into our, our social realm that um, take away our voices really early on our individual voices that know really pretty much right out of them, right out, off the bat, what we are. And, um, you know, that it, it's just the way things have developed. It, it's, I 
feel like it's almost because they need to monetize every part of you. But um, mm, sure. we, we just we just know so much so young and so early on. And I think that, you know, that's the thing that um, that you just need to know that you really you have all the answers inside of you already. Hmm. Yeah. What, what have, you know, if it's not too personal to ask, like what was kind of, if, was there anything that was kind of taken away from you that you kind of had to kind of return back to knowing in your life? Um, I think that it's always, or for a long time, it's a, a little, it's a feeling of like you're being golemed by yourself. <laughs> There's this part of you that's kind of, you know, following along that you know is there, um, but you're just sort of, you know, not really in, ready to embrace it. Or there's a lot of fear about figuring things out in yourself. And um, I think that, you know, it, it, it's not something, oddly enough, it, it's, it's a scary thing. And, um, I think that it's hard to, I think, you know, for me, it was, it took a while for me to be able to embrace a lot of the, the things I knew and I knew I knew, but I just didn't want to look at them. And it was just a slow process of kind of glancing over at it and, and seeing it and knowing, and, and maybe not obsessing on it too much, but realizing, well, that, that kind of is who I am. <laughs> and then it wasn't yeah, bad stuff. Sure. It was just kind of scary stuff. Like I, I'm probably going to be, you know, having to work hard for a long time and I might not have kids. And it was like a lot of stuff that I didn't really want to just put right down in front of me to think about consciously. Yeah. I, I, I'm reminded of a time recently where I'm like, Oh, I like, I, it was really important for me to say, I really like X. I forgot what it was. I actually, I prefer not to say it out loud, but just, I shared it with Isaac, just like, I really like this. And like, it's important for me to say that because I, I want to just like honor what is, you know what I mean? Versus exactly. having to ignore it or be ashamed of it. And I think there's so much power in that because it opens the door for so much to come in that is for you that you're not kind of blocking out due to, you know, you ignoring your truth. Oh, for sure. And I think it, it just kind of takes that, uh, the, the fear out of it. It takes the fear out of like mm -hmm. when you just sort of just say it I, I, like, for, like mm -hmm. in a kind of silly way, my husband's really into metal music and, um, I really, really <laughs> wanted to be into metal cause it seemed so cool. And I felt like, but sure. I, I really love melodic. <laughs> Not that black metal isn't melodic, but um, it was a lot of noise music. No, I gotcha. And um, it just, so at a certain point I was like, you know, I, li I like the more melodic stuff. And so we started laughing and he was like, well, we'll put some of your puff stuff on. I was like, yeah, the puff stuff. <laughs> and the, <laughs> the metal stuff we started calling the pup. And so I, I was like, well, this is music for the pups and I think they'd like it, but I think you're going to put a little puff stuff on. <laughs> now for me and it sort of took the the nasty or the uncool feeling of it because it made it kind of silly and funny mm -hmm. and then he started liking some of the puff stuff i love it yeah so we kind Wonderful. of made it we're all the melodic oh yeah yeah we love we love the melodic too yeah i love, love it. it also also metal yeah for sure yeah um can i connect this for me or tell me that it's not connected however this goes um the the process of process there's a word again the process of um like catching that part of yourself out of the corner of your eye and 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 having that come into your field of vision and then working with that um relate that for me or again tell me it's not related um to your to your to your evolution as an artist and also as a business person i suppose it's not a label that i want to put forward but like you know, you're, you're, you're a small, intimate design studio. You all are, you all are building things on, on your own name. Um, what is it, is there a connection between like that kind of dawning relationship with oneself and self-knowledge to what you do as an artist and like making a living with that? Is there a connection there? Um, 
I think to be more direct, the question that I want to ask comes from something that I've heard from a lot of people who who want to make a career by making things. Um, it, it, it's kind of related to like finding one's own voice and then betting on it. Mm. So I think the question I'm asking is about like your your you know the the dawning self knowledge over time, how that relates to the ability to make true art or like to 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 express oneself truly. Um, and then further, just one more layer, like doing that in a way that, you know, has to pay the bills next month, that kind of thing. Um, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. I mean, it, it is kind of hard to wear all the roles of like not only your identity, but uh, a business person and a creative person. Mm -hmm. And I think in small business, yeah. we, we, we all put on those many, many hats and there's some we're better at and some we're not. And, and it's, we can really beat ourselves up for the ones that we're not, especially if the ones we're not good at is connected to money. <laughs> um, and, um, I think that's, that's part of, that's, a, that's a really big struggle for us. Um, neither Peter mm -hmm. or myself are, are business people. So, um, but yet a big chunk of our creative world is, needs to have a very um, streamlined business understanding going forward so that we can, you know, continue to do what we want to do. And that was something that we slowly had to come to terms with in that we can't do it all ourselves sort of feeling. And we had to start looking for help in the areas that we needed the help in. And it was hard because at first we didn't want to pay for it. We just figured, oh, it'll be fine, but you got to, it's not going to be fine as you're getting bigger. You just need to, you got to figure that stuff out. That's the stuff that'll really come back and bite you. If you don't lay that, those are the process steps too, that are important to take and um, just finding good people who knew what they were doing. And we went through a lot of people who didn't trying to be cheap, like, Oh, this friend of a friend of mine can do this for you just for, you know, a favor. If you do this for, and, that kind of thing was, it sort of was okay, like a little patch over something for a short period of time, but it's not a long-term thing. And we just started to realize, you know, if this is going to really work, we, we had to be a little more uh, smart about how, who we trusted with and understand that we can't do it all. And that there were going to be people that we needed in our lives that, that really understood that part of having a business. Was there, I, I love all that and I totally agree. And we're in the process of doing that over the last couple of years with our business in, in a lot of different ways. But was there, was there a moment where maybe you had to like put down your pride to do that? It was there, was pride ever or the ego ever a factor in you doing that or not doing that? I'm not, I think I was born a servant. <laughs> I, I do cool. not have a ton of that going on. And, you know, neither does Peter. I don't think we had to deal with pride. I think it was more um, fear of, you know, financially being able to handle paying for somebody who knew what they were doing. And, um, uh -huh. and, and being able to sustain that relationship without them tearing without that person tearing their eyes out having to talk to us because uh -huh. we were so sure. not you know understanding the language they were speaking so there was there was a, a, a i guess maybe i don't know if that would be pride but it, it was definitely it was a struggle to take For them sure. to understand a business language so that we could talk to the people we needed to talk to to help us with what we needed help mm -hmm. with and um mm -hmm. So we had to we had to make that a priority, which is hard because you just want to do what yeah. you want to do and not do the the business end for us. There's some people who don't to totally do the business part. Yeah, totally. And as we're as we're approaching wrapping here, it, it occurs to me that we've never actually talked about like what it is you do. So as sort of a like going from the you know find people who can take these roles in the business um, to reflecting on your own. As we're closing, what like what do you what do you do? Like what is your specific wheelhouse? What do you make? Well, I think 
my role in USI is often the creative direction. So it'll be, hmm. well, so I, I'm just thinking about what is next. And, um, yeah. and then Peter helps flesh that out with a lot of the, his background is, is, is heavily in, um, like he had a, a lot of technical drawings, drafting. Um, he's just a, an exquisite drafts person and artist. Mm-hmm. He, had, he actually went to school for art. I did not. I went to his cool. artist loft and <laughs> apprentice <laughs> and soaked it all in. Um, cool. But yeah, so he's he, he will take an idea and then he'll start flushing it out. And then um, I'll move back into it and get bring some narrative into it. And then we'll go back and forth mm-hmm. like that. And it's just, a, it's just the two of us. So, um, and, and Nick Erickson is our office manager and all around amazing. Cool. He does a lot of printing for us. So yeah, there's, it's, it's a Neat. dynamic that works really well for a small little company. Oh, that's beautiful. And, and I love that our listeners can hear that a team of three can work with Louis Vuitton or these big names, because I think that sometimes we have this perception that, oh, we need to have it all together or we need to like be this really big conglomerate or, you know, organization in order to, to do bigger, bigger projects with different global brands. And I, I just find that really inspiring as someone who's building something with Isaac. Um, so we, we, we are going to wrap up this call with two final questions. Lene, what does an empowered you look like and feel like? <laughs> um, and empowered me is is a creative me working mm-hmm. creatively, doing what I do all day is makes yeah. me feel empowered. Um, but I'll feel empowered putting clothes on the line because it's yeah, yeah, I just yeah. enjoy being in the world. I'm very grateful, very very grateful to be mm-hmm. here for all the the mm-hmm. sadness and and all this, the turmoil that has happened. Um, especially in the past year. Uh, and there's been a lot of sadness and things to come to terms with. Um, but I still participate in the joyfulness of the world. And I'm very grateful to find mm-hmm. that in my life. Mm-hmm. Thank you That's for sharing really that. beautiful. Um, I will say a thing that brings me joy and is a byproduct of your joy in the world is we play cards with our friends a lot and we have your card deck and it, it several, them. several of them and it just makes us so happy because they're like oh my gosh like who are you guys with these amazing <laughs> cards i'm like thank you so much we have such good taste and we know these amazing artists you should buy them <laughs> but yeah thank you uh, that's just a moment of joy for me i love that oh, thank you though. that makes me so happy uh, wonderful. Um, and then in closing, the very last question is, what do you know for sure? Yeah, I know for sure I love Peter um, and my family mm-hmm. and my friends. That is what I know for sure. <laughs> mm-hmm. I love that. Beautiful, easy, simple love. Lene, thank you for your time. It's, I, I, I treasure the opportunity to chat with you. Thank you for being here. And Lene, I hope that we can meet one day in person and I drink so. wine or tea or whatever it is and talk about life and art because this project, you know, just really connects us with amazing people. And um, we're just so grateful for your art and your presence. And may we all have a little bit of fearlessness in the way that your dad taught you because it is really beautiful. And yeah, you're right. Like, we're just happy to be here too. So thank you for your time and your your essence today. We really appreciate you. Thank you. And I've got a pair of roller skates and a barn and a trampoline. I don't have a pool, but yeah, we could, we could do that. If get here. <laughs> Done. Oh, fantastic. Done. I look forward to it. Cheers. Lene. <laughs> Cheers. Right. Bye. See you guys. Bye. This podcast is the work of Lightword, our company, named for that toward the light direction which informs every single thing that we do, including money. Which means, like everything else, the way we earn revenue is not based on industry norms. It's based on what feels deeply right and aligned by passing through the door that feels like it has more behind it, not less. And the way we keep this podcast going is all Lightword. It's pay what feels good. It's an exchange of value between you and us. We're keeping conventional podcast advertising totally out of this. And here's how pay what feels good works. We give you this episode because it feels good to do so. And you consider, honestly, what number of dollars this episode is genuinely worth to you. 
I do not care if that's $3, $1,000, or literally $0 and a heart emoji, as long as that trade genuinely makes your day better. And the energy there is the entire point. That is what we're building our business on. No advertisers, no selling your attention, just you and us, trading value in a way that builds us both up. So whatever the number, when you're done listening, head to empoweredhumanacademy.com and hit the pay what feels good button. We use this policy across all of our company's work, and I'm really excited to bring it here to the world of podcasts. This is us voting for the world we want to see. Thank you for being here.